proof. New beginning. It's not small this year. No, it's not small this year. I finally got this up on stage so people can see. And our room isn't like huge left and right, so now it's like deep and everybody can see. Alright, so. Wow, this has been like a crazy knockathon so far. Yeah, so uh, for those who don't know, I'm John Boise. Uh, I'm the programming concom, or assistant programming concom for NACACON. So I have been running around pretty much nonstop for the past two days, and there's so much still to go. But everything seems to be really awesome this year from what I've seen. Are you guys having fun? Yeah! Oh, good. That makes me feel better. All right, so uh, I'm John. This is the Anime Mythbusters panel, the panel where we put anime scenarios to the test of science. I started work on this panel in 2008. I performed it first at Nakacon in 2009, and every year I spend like 100 or 200 hours preparing new material that I always debut here at Nakacon. To put that another way, that's like working a full-time job for a month. That's like crazy. Why would I put so much time and effort into something that I don't get paid for? <laughs> well, I want to take a little bit of time to explain why I would do something like that. The reason is I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed that like, when I look at rankings of scientific literacy among industrialized nations, America is almost at the bottom. I'm embarrassed that when I look at what they say about American scientific literacy, they say things like this. Many Americans do not give correct answers to basic factual questions about science and questions about the scientific inquiry process. And I'm bad, embarrassed that when I look at what those basic factual questions are, it's stuff like this. How long does it take for the Earth to go around the moon? Sun. I'm sorry, the sun. The answer is it takes one year, and the people who are asked that question only on average got it 62% of them right. But not everyone was asked that question on the survey. First, they had to answer a question on whether the Earth goes around the sun or the sun goes around the Earth. And they also had to answer a question on whether or not the Earth goes around the moon or the moon goes around the Earth. That's where I was getting the moon thing from. So really, uh, on that question, about 20% of it got it wrong. So we're looking at 62% uh, of 80%. So that's pathetic. But at the one hand, I mean, like, who cares? It's a definition of a year. How often do we use the definition of a Maybe on December 31st when we're drunkenly making New Year's resolutions, we won't keep the next day. <laughs> but what if it is something important, something you interact with, something that maybe will concern your life or the life of your loved ones? For example, true or false, antibiotics kill viruses as well as bacteria? That's false. Antibiotics only work on bacteria, and that's only if they're not getting resistant. Yet, um, only about 53% of people know this. This is a true or false question. We can get a 50% just by sheer guessing. Three and a half percent better than dumb luck? America, what's wrong with you? So that's why I started putting things together with this panel. Um, I don't think things like this are the problem. I think, think, um, think things like this are a symptom. The problem is really hard to kind of define because it has economic, religious, and political motives to it. But one of the things I always see when I'm trying to figure out what the problem is so I can maybe you know, fix it, is apathy. People don't care about science. The only time people seem to care about science is when it's not science, and it's pseudoscience, fake science, bad science. It's why we have huge portions of America that still believe that the Earth is less than 10,000 years old, that the Big Bang never happened, that uh, let's see, vaccines cause autism. Things that are just blatantly wrong, and that's when people get interested. So what I wanted to try to do with this panel is remind people that science can be fun, and it doesn't have to be bullshit. <laughs> so, that being said, let's go ahead and get started, but I need to give you a quick warning that I give every year. This panel contains algebra, scientific notation, technical language, and calculus. <laughs> Any of this, that's actually okay because the way I always do this panel 
is I'll show you what I'm talking about. I'll tell you what I'm going to ask the question if there really is one. I'll talk about the science, go through all the math if there is it, and then I'll tell you what it means and put it in context. So the context is the important part. So I'm going to start off, I always do a couple from previous years that I've uh, really enjoyed. And this year I've got four new ones, which uh, they're really good. I'm really excited to show these. Since we had Steve Bloom here, I decided we should do one with Cowboy Bebop. So this uh, comes from a, I think the Heavy Metal Queen was the name of the episode. What are you going to do? My floating hat. So, I took a deep breath, yeah, I mean, there's kind of mixed things about this. I really wanted to tackle this topic when I first added it, because this is done in a lot of different shows and movies where people talk about decompression effects like this. And so let's talk about real science behind it. Um, so what happens here is he's in his cockpit, he jumps out of a cockpit into a vacuum across to another ship. Overall, he's in a vacuum for about 30 seconds, he lands on the other ship, takes a deep breath, and yeah, whatever, it cool. All right, so what's wrong with that? Well, there's two things you actually have to worry about. The first is the explosive decompression. That's when you go from a normal atmospheric pressure to almost none really, really quickly. The second is when there is no pressure and you're in a vacuum, what, that, what is that going to do to you? Um, I was gonna originally make like a two column list, but it overlapped so much I ended up just making one. First off, uh, there's no oxygen, so you can't breathe. You won't have much oxygen in your blood. It's called hypoxia. It makes you kind of turn blue. Decompression sickness is when you don't have the pressure on the outside of your body. The gas that is dissolved in the blood and other parts of your body doesn't stay in solution. It expands. So it's a whole ideal gas law thing. And this is going to cause a lot of problems, namely the bends. The nitrogen in your blood expands and starts blocking blood flow. Not cool. It can lead to an instant heart attack. Uh, also, the expansion of these gases can rip apart your nervous system. Yeah, not fun. Other soft tissues it can rip apart would be things like your pulmonary tissue, your sinuses, your eardrums. Things that won't rupture would be like your internal organs and your abdomen, but it's going to hurt a lot. And on top of that, you might feel a bit nauseous. <laughs> All of this comes from a uh, source, the uh, Rapid Explosive Decompression Emergencies and Pressure Student su Subjects. It was done by NASA when they were getting ready for the space program. And they didn't do this to people intentionally, but there were a few accidents that happened. Uh, what they did do, though, is they tested this out on oh, I'm sorry, uh, animals, cute, fuzzy little rats. And a bunny. What you can see here, and now I really actually wish that I hadn't done this, is you can see it went from a normal atmospheric pressure, this third column here, to a very low pressure, the fourth column. And it says decompression time, seconds, so they did it in first a uh, six-tenths of a second, which is pretty fast by normal people's standards, but I guess it's not really that long because they went down to one one-thousandth of a second. And the quicker they did this decompression, you can see the left-hand column, I'm sorry, the right-hand column, no, it's the left facing this way, okay, I was right the first time. The left-hand column, the, the quicker you decompress, the more likely you are to die. The question is, where is Spike on here? Yeah, where's uh, Steve Wooden now? Well, fortunately, that uh, report also had a graph on there showing just how, it would, uh, how quickly you would lose the oxygen and be down to that very low pressure. Basically, the y-axis going up and down here is how much air you had to lose, and then the x-axis is uh, how big is the hole it's leaking out of. So, Spike's cockpit was kind of a nice sphere, roughly, and we had a chair in it taking up some spare, some air, but we're going to ignore that to give him the best chance possible. So, I did a little bit of math, figured out what it should be, and it turns out Spike's right about here, somewhere between 1 100th and 1 1,000th of a second, and this is a logarithmic graph, so it's actually much closer to the 1 1,000th. Which, if you remember, on that previous thing, was way down here at the bottom. <laughs> so, if all those other effects don't suck enough, he has something like an 80 to 90 percent chance of just outright death. <laughs> Maybe he did just got lucky. But would you want to take that risk? Yeah. I would rather play Russian roulette. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, it's like a full depth, yes. I mean, there's always that kind of, yeah, you can maybe be brought back if you want to be. Um, I, I did skip it on the previous slide, the last thing there, it said if you had 5 to 15 seconds of useful, useful consciousness, then you have about 5 seconds of being blue, and then you're unconscious. Um, I mean, you'll still be survivable after that. I did find an instance where somebody did kind of, they lost the pressure more slowly, so you didn't have the explosive, but they were under vacuum conditions for a good minute, minute and a half, and they were completely fine uh, afterwards. So that wasn't too bad. Yeah? The, on the graph, this mortality percent, is that the instant death or the... That's just eventual death, yeah. Um, you're not going to live too long if your uh, central nervous system is being torn apart. Right. Yeah, your brain can't communicate with your heart to say, keep going, guys. So, if I were Spike, I wouldn't want to do that. 